Well, one sense you could come at it from a nutritional aspect. Uh, some people would say in terms of more what raises your energy and is in alignment with the truth. I mean, there's different right. angles. Uh, some people that are more concerned with health of the body would see it maybe more from a nutritional standpoint of, of, of taking care of your vehicle uh, and keeping it clean and clear and flowing and open. And vibrationally, others may see it that way. It's more that uh, that food is is still just like a backdrop to opening your mind to this inner guidance and um, so it's like the mystics and the saints reach a point where fear or lack or limitation is released from their mind so you might say it becomes a moot point it's like they don't really need to eat but still they're guided and flowing along maybe as a teaching device. Um, Jesus is a good example, you know, he he would make references that he had, the, the disciples, the apostles were concerned about him not eating enough uh, while he was doing all these teachings with the masses and he said, I have manna from above. Uh, I, in other words, I live on light. <laughs> uh, it's, I don't live on on fish and bread, I live on light. Uh, but yet he still seemed to eat the fish and the bread. He seemed to eat with the apostles. Uh, it made him a better teaching example. It would be hard to relate to Jesus if he came to earth, he seemed to walk on water, he never put anything in his mouth, he never defecated, he never <laughs> took a leak anywhere. I mean, it would be like, alien, look at the alien over there. And, and it's, there's, it's, you can't relate very well uh, from a human being to an alien. But if you see someone it still comes down in the same context of follow your inner guidance. And that could be, you know, to eat vegetables or to eat fruits. Uh, it, it could be, in the ultimate sense, I think for me, it went to join with your brothers and sisters wherever you seem to be, whatever country, whatever culture, and part of the joining is not throwing up any limits or barriers. So I was told early on, eat whatever is served. And which is a discipline of mind when, when the ego has preferences of what it likes, what it doesn't like, what it believes is healthy, what it believes is unhealthy. It can throw up all kinds of blocks and roadblocks. Yeah. And this was a way of saying, no, don't, don't make food an issue at all. Uh, join without having food be a block. Whether you get into food or sexuality or a lot of different areas which seem very important in the human experience, the answer is always going to be follow your guidance mm -hmm. because the mind that believes it's in this world has set up blocks to truth or love and now it's up to the spirit to join and remove those blocks and in that sense it's highly individualized because even though there's only one ego the way that that ego plays out in terms of human beings is it plays out in terms of enormous variation so for someone who may be guided to eat a piece of meat as part of their loosening from certain restrictions and, and limits that they've placed on their mind, uh, someone else may be guided to, to eat vegetables <laughs> and fruits as part of that uh, loosening of those rules and rigid restrictions. So that's why we can't really make broad sweeping generalizations about never eat a piece of meat, or never have sex, or never do, you know, those kind of generalizations uh, would not be helpful because uh, only the spirit uh, knows what's best for someone at a given point. Like for example, there was, in the early years of A Course in Miracles in the 1980s, there were two pioneers, uh, a man and a woman named Barbara and Robert Varley. And they had done rebirthing for years, they had had the course for years, they began working on a daily basis, getting up at four or five in the morning, reading the course and the Lamsa Bible and all these spiritual texts, very devotional life. 
They had been vegetarians for years. They actually got into microbiotics, macrobiotics, and it was a very disciplined uh, eating routine. And they were told in their macrobiotics books, do not attempt to drop this diet and start eating meat uh, immediately from this diet. There will be enormous consequences to your body if you attempt to drop this diet immediately. And they were praying with the Holy Spirit and, and asking about this and they received guidance that they were to stop eating uh, a macrobiotic diet. The next day they received an invitation in the mail that invited them, they lived in Texas, to a Texas style barbecue. Pork and beef and chicken, these kind of barbecues, they bar barbecue many different kinds of meat and it's all meat, 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 meat and they prayed on it and they were guided by the Holy Spirit to go <laughs> to the barbecue and to eat the meat. So they did and there were no ill effects. Um, so it's again, it was, it was a powerful experience, much like the Ram Das story of, of the guru uh, taking the whole you know, handful of powerful you know, LSD pills and showing no signs or reactions. For the Varleys who are working with the course, uh, that was a powerful experience going to that Texas style barbecue right after having months and months of a very rigid macrobiotic diet. There's nothing special about meat, nothing special about macrobiotics or vegetarianism or whatever, but these are all just symbols that the Spirit uses to show you of your invulnerability of the power of your mind. That's so good news. <laughs> It takes away a lot of neurosis and and guilt about uh, oh the belief I've eaten the wrong thing and I was actually in South America at a, at a mountain town it was in a valley uh, and I was at this town at a spiritual community and some of the teachers had come there and and had told them that they were the people were eating meat and that they were had bad karma and they were bringing all these this ill kind of things upon themselves and. The teacher actually accused these people in this town of Medellin. He said that they smelled like dead meat, uh, told the students, and, and the students had, a lot, had some guilt over this. So when I got there, they had many questions, you know, about karma, about eating animals, and, and so forth. And we had to take it way back into the mind, into from the actions you do or don't do in form, but it's the belief structure where the guilt comes in. And then when you free yourself of those beliefs, then, then you experience your innocence. And that's when you have health. Health is a state of mind. It's inner peace. It's not uh, doing the right things in form. It's just clearing your mind and then your actions will flow from, from that healed mind and all are blessed. Symptoms are just chosen by the mind and symptoms are made to reflect guilt or project the guilt from the mind onto the body. So if you seem to have a, a sore body or an ill body or a painful body, then those are projections and when you have a contact with your divine innocence, then the body is neutralized, you might say. and uh, and. It's kind of subtle because you could say, well, then that means if I work with the Course, then uh, I should feel really good. My body should feel real good. Uh, and that could be taken to, I, I should have lots of pleasure and no pain. And we, when you read a, a Course workbook lesson like 136, you know, basically Jesus is teaching in there, you can tell you've practiced well in the mind training by this, the body should not feel at all. Oh, well, should not feel at all. That's a lot different than feeling well. <laughs> so it shouldn't feel well or ill. It becomes more like meditation when you sink deeper and deeper into meditation and you go deeper into those states and you literally lose awareness of the body. That's a more accurate approximation of where this is heading than to think that, oh, I'll have nothing but pleasureful experiences uh, because pleasure and pain 
uh, both physically and psychologically, are both part of the ego's uh, continuum. And when you wash your mind free of, uh, of the ego, you're basically uh, coming to a state of joy or intimate love that's, that's divine. And that's where this is heading. So we're, we're painting a more accurate picture here, yeah. not thinking, oh, I'll just use the Course and have all the pleasure uh, maximized and, and eliminate the pain. It's, uh, it's a much deeper than that. And that's very important because uh, Jesus says that in this world you're, you're so confused that you can't tell the difference between joy and pain. And when he puts that line in there, then it just shows you how deep the mesmerism is. For most p human beings, they would say, well, I sure can tell the difference uh, between joy and pain. But it just shows you how deep the mesmerism is uh, and how much clearing you have to do to come to this state of non-attachment or bliss that's based totally in the present moment, which is causeless in the sense that it's, it's a natural experience, but there's nothing in the world of form. You might say that there's no person, place, or thing that can bring you that joy. It's just what you are. And when you've removed all the attachments to the person's places and things, then you simply naturally are what you are. And it's a very wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. It's typical in interpersonal relationships when you find somebody and, oh, no one's loved me this way and nobody's done that to me and nobody's made me feel this way. Right. Well, the flip side is when the, the person says goodbye, <laughs> that there's some sense of loss or sadness uh, or deprivation. And that shows right away that, that the ego motives were involved. Whereby, if you're in your function, if you're simply radiating and shining your light and your love to everyone that you come across, everyone you meet, uh, when they say goodbye, you just do your namaste and send them off their way with their blessings and there's no, no problem. So you can always tell uh, the ego is involved when, when the flip side comes in, when you start feeling a sense of lack or deprivation. Yes. Well, it, to me it fits in with the same topic uh, we talked about of food, that it all comes down to guidance. Uh, the Spirit knows what's best for you at any given point of the awakening, and once you start to see that everything in your world is symbolic, that everything in your world is a reflection of your mind, and even when you're just beginning to see glimpses of that, you still will receive guidance of wh what to say, what to do, where to go, what to eat. Um, and in terms of who you spend your time with, uh, whether it's to be with a group of people or with a, a person as a partner or by yourself uh, off meditating, maybe at a, a retreat or off at a hermitage or whatever. So it still comes back to that intuitive following that's so important. And you might say that what seems to be a partnership is still a teaching learning opportunity in which you clear your mind. And beyond that, in other words, uh, we could just use Jesus as an example of a mind that, that clearly is unified by the statements it made, I and the Father are one. Uh, before Abraham was, I am. This is a mind that's not in time and space even, it's speaking, it's like eternity speaking, <laughs> you know, seemingly through a man. And yet, 12 apostles. Why 12? Why not 11? Why not 13? Why male? Uh, you know, the times, uh, historically, you know, it had something to do with that in terms of being received and being respected. Uh, there were women, uh, in the Urantia book it talks about the women corps, there were many supportive women that were part of, of Jesus' ministry that, that really didn't make it through the Bible and everything, but they were very involved. But, but in terms of the apostles, you know, it was 12 men. They, this is part of a, a specific prearranged plan in which the symbols are being used by the Spirit as part of a teaching device. So in my case, I've certainly traveled around. There have been times I've been partnered up with people. I've been partnered up with singer-songwriters. That has been very helpful in terms of sharing this uh, with the music. I've been partnered up with translators. I've been partnered up with those that have traveled with me. And, and at times I've traveled solo. 
the form has has varied, but but you might think of each particular form as as a, uh, an opportunity to to let the symbols be used. For example, recently I have been partnered with Kirsten, and when I traveled to South America, the questions that came from the audience were relationship based. They weren't so much tell us about mysticism or tell us about meditation or t contemplation or you know, it was, ah, give us the inner workings of how you and Kirsten live on a daily basis. Tell us of your experiences. And a lot of people that were boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband and wife came to the gathering because the symbol of a man and a woman side by side was something they could relate to. And they were more likely to come to those gatherings and ask those questions because of that symbol. So for me, I just try to stay wide open and let the Spirit use the symbols in whatever way they seem to be helpful. And over time that has seemed to change. And so right now I'm, I'm here in, in Denmark and I'm on a tour. Um, my wife Kirsten's on a tour doing Infradanza in the United States. And I'm here with Anna, my friend from Sweden, and you're here and we're having these gatherings and this is how it looks right now, seemingly. It's just the spirit's use of the symbols. Yeah, I think, it, I see it purely in terms of a state of mind, that, uh, that my function is to be happy, my function is to be joyful, is to be peaceful. I don't really think of my function in, in physical terms anymore. And so uh, I'm just as much in my function when I'm, the body seems to be speaking as when it's not speaking, or when it's traveling about, or it's, you know, pushed up somewhere in a tree, or in a, meditating by a river, or on a couch somewhere. It's a state of mind function for me, and it's been freed of all concepts and ideas uh, that really involve form. It certainly wasn't that way. I mean, I felt early on that I was, the construct of David was very shy, and so I certainly, you know, David would never have chosen a speaking function, but that's part of the way that it played out, uh, where the spirit wanted to, so to speak, use the puppet and speak, you know, through David in many places and many uh, cultures and so forth. So that's the way that it seemed to play out. But there came a point where it was like, oh, my function is just to be happy. And I could say internally uh, happy based on my following of the spirit, not based on getting outcomes that I want. It had nothing to do with, with travel or partnership or friends. It had nothing to do with uh, money or resources or uh, beautiful places or you know any of the things that the world might associate. I'll be happy when I get the picture to come out a certain way. It had nothing to do with any of that. It's just, I call it happy with for no earthly reason. <laughs> that's the best, I mean that's the only happiness is happy for no earthly reason. Mm -hmm. Because you're happy because of who you are. You know, how your source created you. That's, that's where perfect happiness resides because it can't be touched. God's not changing God's mind and God gives only perfect happiness so that's that is the perfect flow and the perfect uh, extension of, of being happy all the time. So that's your state all the time? Happiness. Yeah, yeah, happiness. I stay happy. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons why people even invite me uh, is they go, hmm, he seems happy and, right. and people want to be Fine. around. Yes, authentic happiness. You know, I mean, certainly all of us tried to be happy through, we could say, ungodly means <laughs> or perceptual means where we've tried to get the right things, the right combination of things in our life or to accumulate or possess or to control and that never resulted in lasting happiness but but being in the present moment you know is a natural high, a natural happiness and so the invitations come and they still are coming but also uh, I just follow the prompts. If, if I'm guided to just go off and 
and into seeming obscurity and just be in joy and bliss in that state of mind, it will be of benefit to the universe because it's just a state of mind. And uh, so that's why I was talking uh, with Anna today and I was saying, yeah, I have no, I have no interest in the future. I have absolutely no interest, a complete disinterest in the future. You might want to go to a psychic and kind of get a little snapshot of, aren't you a little curious? And say, no, it's, uh, I'm not, I, I don't, my mind doesn't work that way anymore. I'm not um, looking ahead to anything. I'm I'm very content with right now. And uh, so, when people say, you know, how will it all end? You know, in in one sense, the ego ends once you've released it and forgiven it, and then you just radiate God's love. And uh, the past and the future are not part of that equation anymore. It's just present joy. Yeah, you, you could say that it's the spirit works with the mind with whatever it believes and you could say that those are still concepts and in one sense we could say a golden age of humanity would be a better illusion <laughs> than, yeah, and, and yet uh, just the idea of a better illusion um, you know, implies that, uh, I guess you could say in a helpful way that it would be a peaceful experience with perception. And what I'm saying is, uh, it's possible to train your mind to have that experience now. In fact, it's inevitable that you can only have it now. So when you try to put it on the timeline, and then you get into things, how many years before I'm in and sinlessness and innocence and then just radiating that. So it, those kind of ideas just uh, don't, it's like they don't register. I don't have, uh, I have nothing in my mind to hold the idea of a future golden age and yet from a place of blessing I can see that that, that is, for many people that's a, that's a goal that they use as an incentive to do their practices. You know, because they they believe in time and that's something that can be used as an incentive, a concept that's an incentive for them to to do their work, to do their practices. Yeah. or lots of different um, rituals or techniques or something that, that you're supposed to practice diligently, you know, repeat over and over and over and over. Whereas this is talking about starting to discipline your mind and getting closer to that point where you can start to let go of the rituals and become so intuitive uh, that you flow. And there's a, a part in the teacher's manual of A Course in Miracles where Jesus is asked, you know, you know, how does, the, how does the teacher of God spend his day? And Jesus answers, you know, to the advanced teacher of God, this question is superfluous. In other words, it's not even something that, that is a, a question. Uh, it's so spontaneous to the advanced teacher of God. Life becomes so spontaneous. How do you spend your day is something that never <laughs> gets asked because you're in the moment and that's how you spend your day. <laughs> moment by moment would be the answer. But you see, in terms of things like with chakras, the, that's the symbol of opening. You know, chakras re representing different aspects of your experience and the base chakras and then the higher chakras and so forth. Those are symbols that, that are very much, when you go into Indian philosophy and, and, and teachings and so forth, they're very basic, uh, very well known. Um, 
when you get into something like uh, Christianity or something, you know, that are not universal, but that they're just symbols that of opening, of of clearing away. Uh, just like working with energy, you know, raising the energy, uh, coming to higher energies. Now the ego can use any of them for its own purposes as well. In terms of comparison, you know, uh, your higher, higher energy, someone has higher energy than another person, there's a comparison. Or a more purified uh, aura, uh, oh, this color is better than that color, or this color, you have a more perfect or more pure it's still judgment, it's still comparisons, and it's still personal. And so you can see that even when you start to get into uh, psychic states and more uh, psychic phenomenon, or, or phenomena that seem to be more other, uh, otherworldly or more beyond the everyday perception, the ego still is right there wanting to use those psychic abilities or those phenomenon to reinforce its specialness you know, a special aura, a special mantra, a special uh, uh, state of mind. And I remember early on when I was reading a lot of non-dualistic uh, books, I, early on I popped open a very thin book by, uh, it was Talks with Sri Ramana Maharshi. And I opened this book up and there were all these people asking Ramana Maharshi about the yogis. You know, some could uh, change colors and I believe that in that book uh, that I read there was something about a yogi that would, would turn himself green and fly. And of course I was extremely impressed. I was like, oh my God. for that kind of state of mind, it was saying, you know, don't get caught up in the phenomena, uh, whatever they are, you know, realize that there is a grand surprise, and that grand surprise is self-realization. It's the, the awareness of who you are, as, as you were created by your source. So along the way, don't get caught up in any temptations with the psychic phenomenon. And I've really taken that to heart, so that when I've had uh, kind of supernatural experiences or phenomenon. It was very ordinary. It was almost to be expected. Like miracles are, are natural, these phenomena, oh yeah, okay. They come, they go, no big deal, nothing to just go on and on about. Uh, and, and other mystics like uh, Peace Pilgrim said the same thing. You know, she had experiences with feeling total, absolute connectedness and oneness and like flecks of gold coming down from the sky and and uh, the plants all vibrating around her as if coming to life with colors. And she said, nah, they're relatively unimportant. <laughs> the, the experience of the oneness, however, and the connection, that's what's important. you realize that that's the focal point and you it will make everything much simpler because particular systems have many different uh, symbols and can seem to be quite complex and then when the ego starts to do this comparing and contrasting it even gets more complex that's just telling you no it's not it's not the way when you can come back to how you feel experientially and let that be your guide that's, I call that being very intuitive. Mm. And it, that intuitive experience is your guide, not what some guru said or not what some master said. Oh, the words are, they can seem to be very inspiring, they can be, point you in the right direction, they can reassure you, they can comfort you, but in the end it comes down to your experience, your authentic experience which I would say is being present. Once you can be present and feel that love, then, then you know that that's, you've, you've done well.
in your spiritual journey. Yeah, yeah, certain states of mind that can seem to come and go. Sometimes people will have a mystical experience and then when it seems to be covered over or it seems to fade away, then the tendency can be to start, you know, to try to get it back. Yeah. And yet they had no uh, experience, no essence of what they did to even bring it on, much less get it come back. And, and again, that's still seeing it on the timeline. So when people say, well, I had a revelatory experience uh, ten years ago, but I haven't had one since, then it's just plucked <laughs> from the now, which is what it is, and put on the timeline, as if it's just pigeonholed into some little place ten years ago or whatever, and of course that's, that's not it at all. Oh, just just to be really gentle with yourself, be very intuitive, authentic, and, uh, and have fun. I mean, I'm teaching and sharing that the present moment is fun. It's playful, it's spontaneous, it's, it's not so serious. Uh, a lot of times when people work with the Course and other metaphysical systems, it's become so, so serious, almost like, like okay, I can't be playing around. and playful and joyful and that's really how you know that you're in it and I always tell people if, if your practice becomes too serious or your pathway becomes too serious then you should really contemplate being open to another <laughs> that the ego has taken over your spiritual path and you need to come back to authenticity and, and give the ego a little gentle nudge and say, enough of this. Right. Well, not for everyone. I mean, it's certainly, I say against it, it comes down to inner guidance and um, people work with the book in different ways. Um, I, it was helpful for me, so I just have used the symbols. But now, when I join with people, you know, we just join in the flow of the spirit, and whatever comes is whatever comes, and it looks how it looks. So uh, I'm not affiliated with the Course in Miracles or or any particular pathway or tradition or country or anything now, and it feels very expansive and universal and very natural. <laughs> Thank you. Blessings, blessings. I can finally let go. I am free, free. I can let my true self show. I am free. Yes, and all this time has been here inside. I can finally let go I am free